I want you to, to think about those words as we get started this morning. Of what it looks like for us to say, Lord, here I am, send me. Because the character that we're, we're looking at today is, is Joseph. Joseph didn't necessarily say, here I am, Lord, send me. Uh, an angel of the Lord came to Joseph and said, we're choosing you. But what is that response? And as we go, as we go being sent and, and called by the Lord to himself, to the, the work of his kingdom, what I want you to take from Joseph today is what it looks like to just obediently listen to the voice of God. And that's what we're going to learn this morning. Um, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Matthew chapter 1. And if you have your fill-in-the-blank uh, bulletins there, that will lead us through this morning. Who is Joseph? Let's start with the obvious one. He is the earthly father to Jesus. Uh, we're told in Matthew chapter 1, um, this is at the end of the genealogy of Jesus, that Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is called the Messiah. All right, so I'm not telling you anything new that Mary and Joseph are the earthly parents of Jesus. The, the two kind of narr the birth narratives that we get um, are in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Matthew, which is the one we're going to be looking at today, um, is the one from Joseph's perspective. And then the Luke kind of birth narrative is from Mary's perspective. Um, so if you want to learn about Mary's perspective, I'll invite you back in a few weeks. But this is just what we really need to know about Joseph. This is the role in which he has been chosen to fulfill. That him and Mary have been chosen as the parents of Jesus. And what we're going to look at today is, how does this all go down from Joseph's perspective? Secondly, he worked as a carpenter, a stonemason, some sort of technical trade. Um, the Greek word can be translated a lot of different ways, um, and most people settle on it. He was either a carpenter or um, a stonemason. We're told in Matthew chapter 13, when Jesus is back in um, his hometown of Nazareth, the people scoff and say, well, he's just a carpenter's son, um, that he is the, the son of Joseph, all of these things. What we're going to look at today, and this little statement about Joseph, is about all we get. And someone who plays such an important role in the, in the birth of Jesus, we really don't have a ton of information about him. As Jesus starts his ministry, we're not told anything of Joseph. Uh, many the kind of common agreeance is, at some point between the birth and, and Jesus' young days in the temple and the time of which Jesus started his ministry, Joseph died. Some will attribute it to the type of work that he did, lots of other things, um, but the common assumption is that somewhere in that time before Jesus started his public ministry, that Joseph passed. All right, so we know he is the earthly father, he's the carpenter. Let's look into what Matthew is going to tell us here. This is how, this is in verse 18, Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. The way in which the biblical authors will use the word engaged to somebody versus how I think we commonly think of it in today's worlds are two different things. Um, the word that used in scripture in Greek is it's actually betrothed. I um, mean, it's a different level of like, what does it mean to be kind of engaged to somebody. Um, if you've ever heard the phrase, there's no dating in the Bible, that's uh, something good to always tell kids um, and the youth. But we kind of get that here in to be engaged to somebody in Jewish customs, you were basically married. The marriage had just not been consummated at that point. 
That's what it means to be betrothed to somebody. To the point to where in, in modern times, if you break off an engagement, you just say, hey, we're done, can I have the ring back? At this time, to, to break off an engagement, you actually would go through the, the public divorce process to break off an engagement. So we have a serious level of commitment here between Mary and Joseph. And this is where we're going to get into the meat of, of who is Joseph. I we're told that Mary is going to have becomes pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break off the engagement quietly. The NLT here, it translates that second part of Joseph, her fiancé. Uh, the Greek word is actually, it, it really reads, Joseph, her husband. Which I think brings us back to this, this last point that we just talked about, of this level of really what it means to be engaged to somebody is, like they're engaged but they're already thought of as, as married and, and people would refer to Joseph as her husband. And then we're told that he's a good man, but he's going to break off this engagement. We would not put those two words in the same sentence most of the time. <laughs> Right? A good man would not break off an engagement with his fiance. So how do we get here? Right? How do we get this situation, which is about to turn in to one of the greatest scandals that, that society would see at this time? Was a woman who is pregnant, out of wedlock, and what looks like it's going to be is now she's going to essentially be a single mother. Yet we have Joseph, a good man, a righteous man. Right, we've talked about what it means to be, to be blameless, to be righteous, that it doesn't mean we are without sin. It's just that they are, when sin is committed, wrong is committed, right, that we take, in this case, the proper steps, the proper ceremonial rituals to become clean. And so what we get here is, is we get an insight into Joseph that he was a man who desired to know God, to keep the laws of the Lord. That's why he is deemed to be a righteous man. Also part of this, in the way lineages and genealogies were kept, it would always be through the Father. I mean, if you read the beginning part of Matthew chapter 1, you can read the words Father of about... 42 times. And so to get to Jesus, who's supposed to be the coming Messiah, who's essentially in to the, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, is going to get his lineage back to David through Joseph, there is this, Joseph should be a righteous man. He would be a man that loves the Lord. And then we get to this part where, where Joseph is, I'm going to call this Joseph is his human reaction of, well, I'm going to get myself out of this mess. Right? Because what it would be, it would be such a public scandal, a public embarrassment. Uh, we talked about Zachariah and Elizabeth with this stigma of hanging over their heads of not having a child. Now we've got Mary and Joseph who are going to have this stigma and this label of having a child, but not at the right time. Right? This is something that they would, they would never be able to escape. They would never be able to run away from the fact of she's pregnant, you're not married, and you might be separated. Which is why we see that Joseph was a righteous man. He was not going to disgrace Mary publicly. And so he decided to break the engagement quietly. This shows the, the humility and the beginning and the first steps of what it looks like for Joseph to protect his family. 
It was going to be better for Joseph to answer all the questions about why they're not engaged, that he could answer the questions, but Mary could sit in silence and not forego the, the public embarrassment and disgrace that she would have received had she walked out the door with no Joseph. This is why I think we can confidently say that Joseph is a man of dignity, a man of humility, a righteous man in the eyes of the Lord. Because let's be honest, if, if this is going to happen, right, that an angel of the Lord comes to him and says, Mary's going to have a child through the Holy Spirit, you're really not going to be a part of it. Right? Many of us, I think, would have a very hard time in just stepping back out of the Lord's plan and becoming sort of a background character to what the Lord wants to do. And that is exactly what Joseph chooses to do because we really get detail that I believe he is an emotionally and spiritually mature man. At this time, it, it, most people and scholars will agree that Joseph was about in his late 20s or so, um, that he had a job. Apparently that was the qualifying factor. I um, hope that mature, you have a job by your 20s. But it's these, these first four words of if you can imagine everything that's, that's swirling on, we're, we're standing in the face of public embarrassment, becoming a fool, something that's like, we can't even wrap our heads around about what is to happen. He's supposed to be a good man, but he's going to face extreme accusation. Mary's going to face extreme accusation. But we're told that he essentially stops and considers what was said to him. I think that as we're, we really look through all of this and what other information we do have about Joseph, it shows a man that was able to stop, consider, and not always make rash, emotional decisions. Let's be honest. We were in Joseph's shoes. We would have hit the hills as soon as it happened. I, I don't even need to think about this. I'm gone. But as he considers this, right, is when the angel of the Lord comes, is Joseph... Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Right? Don't be afraid. This is the work of God himself. And he sits and considers the decisions he's about to make. Because the, the kind of the, the conditions of Divorce at this time were essentially neglect or um, if there was some sort of abuse going on or adultery. That being said, Joseph could start to make as many thoughts and accusations as he would like against Mary. He could go through with the process and everybody he talked to and said, this is what's going on. I'm going to divorce, divorce Mary. Every person he talked to would have said, you have every right to do so. He would have been affirmed to just walk away completely from this. But he sits and considers what he's about to do and gives the Lord himself through an angel at this time a chance to speak. Joseph wasn't going to really earn or receive much from this. But he has a heart that aligns himself to be able to hear from the Lord and to hear clearly from God. All right, what does it look like for us to be emotionally mature and not just make rash decisions, but spiritually mature enough to also hear from the Lord and the word that he has in these moments? Because if Joseph just runs haywire... Who knows how the story ends? Right? But we get this example of a man that is obedient, that is humble. And while the angel is there, he gives us two little quick insights into who Jesus is going to be. 
If you were here with us, I guess it would have been last Sunday. Uh, it feels so long ago. Uh, when we talked about Elizabeth and Zechariah and the importance of names in the Bible. With John, Zechariah, Elizabeth, all throughout Scripture, names are very, very important. Um, especially if your name is changed, like we do see with a couple characters. But we're told that this baby boy will be called Jesus. Right, we will have a son, this is in verse 21, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. Yeah. That's why we have this thing. We all know that's the point of Jesus. But it is deeper than that because the names and everything, like the names in Scripture are so important. I um, mean, it's Jewish custom that the name you were given as a child would, would be a pretty clear indication of characters that, characteristics in which you would possess. It was almost a, a bigger driving factor who you were going to be than your personality or your gifts. It was, so the, the responsibility was really on parents to, to pick a good name. Something that meant something for really what you were going to come into fruition. There is a progression of this. Um, Yehoshua is the, the Hebrew word that we really get. Um, it's the, the form that is shortened into the name Yeshua, uh, which is Joshua. Um, in the Old Testament, who leads the people into the promised land. Um, and then in Greek, where we get the name Jesus, is Jesus. It's a shortened form of Joshua. Um, it's, some of that is translation from Hebrew to Greek and all the fun language stuff. Moral of the story. Joshua, Jesus, it literally means God is salvation. God is deliverance. If you look at Joshua, he was the one that, that led the people into the promised land after being delivered from Egypt. If we know anything about Jesus, it is that Jesus has come to save the people. And it's prophesied about in Gabriel here, or from Gabriel, and that is what we're told, to call him Jesus. Jesus is going to be the savior of the world. But he's also going to be Emmanuel. Right? He's born of a virgin and called Emmanuel. Right? All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. This is a quote from Isaiah. It's a prophecy in Isaiah 7 and 8. Right? Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. It's made up of two Hebrew words. Um, the first one being Amanu, which is a preposition that literally means with us. Um, and El is God. And so, you probably have heard, Emmanuel is God with us. Um, no, Emmanuel is literally um, God with us. What do we get from these two things about Jesus? It means he's going to save the people, but he's also going to know you personally. He will be the savior of the world, but he's going to be with you. He'll be the foundations of the church, but he's going to be with us, the individual church body. Right? We, we only talk about this at Christmas, and it's always been the weirdest thing to me. If Emmanuel is God with us, he's God with us a lot more than just Christmas. And I, know, I know why we talk about it just at Christmas time. I, I am understanding that, but I, I want to encourage you that, that we have this promise like every day that we're alive. If we still have breath in our lungs, it's because God is still with us. And I think Joseph would have known this. That he would have known what Emmanuel means. He would have known these prophecies. So when an angel of the Lord appears and says to him, Mary's going to have a child conceived by the Holy Spirit. The virgin will conceive this child, call him Jesus, for he'll save the people. He would have known what Yeshua means, that this son is literally about to be the deliverance from God. And then you're also going to call him Emmanuel because he's with us. I think it would have all clicked in who is Jesus really going to be and what does it mean that, that we serve a God that, that is the Savior of the world, the whole, 
but also a, a, a God that is so personal to be with us individually. And I think that is why Joseph listens. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But all I could think about as I read this is like, we just look at this and go, you're an absolute fool. And if we look at all throughout scripture, some of the people who just were, like, our, I would call them heroes of the faith that we think about, especially through the Old Testament, like, they, they looked like absolute fools in the moment. Right, one of my favorite characters just to think about and study is Noah. Um, and there's a, there's a quote that kind of goes around of, Noah looked like a fool until it started raining. I was like, ain't that one the truth? Right? And I think Joseph's the, the, same, the same way here. Like, he looks like a, a fool. Like, to stay with Mary, given that, well, it wasn't you, Joseph, so who was it? Right? To stay with an adulterous woman is what the claim and accusation would have been, makes him an absolute fool. The only thing that Joseph really had to stand on was he had a dream of an angel of the Lord saying, take Mary as your wife. Standing on the word of God is good enough, right? And that's just somewhere we have to get in our faith to believe that this really is the word of God and that if we stand on this and we listen to this, it's going to be a stronger and a more firm foundation than what we can find if we just rely on our own intuition, right? Joseph could have done so many, so many other decisions, but he wakes up and he does exactly as the angel of the Lord has commanded. He does not have sexual relations with her until Jesus was born. And then he names his son Jesus. Why is this so important? Once again, Joseph could have made another decision. Right? They could have just consummated their marriage, hoped nobody put two and two together on the timeline, and rode off into the sunset for the rest of their lives. But then we would not be able to have the faith that we do in the virgin birth. Joseph making this decision, right, the point that I made earlier about Joseph being emotionally and spiritually mature, is to do exactly this. Is, yeah, we can follow God. Well, he told me just to take Mary as my wife. But then we can just move on on our plan and, our, and the way we're just going to do things and, and save ourselves from here. I think that's often the times the decisions and the thought process that we do. Lord, I'll do this, but then like we're going to flip lanes and I'm going to take it over from here. Joseph making this decision protects the faith that we actually have in the work of God through Christ. Right, we're going to, in a couple weeks, on... Christmas Eve, we're, we're going to dive into to Mary's account of this, the virgin birth. Why is it actually so important to the Christian faith? And what happens really if it's not true? The implications of it. But if Joseph does not make this decision, if he's not, I, what I really think is like emotionally and spiritually mature to consider what has happened and consider the words from the Lord, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Because there's a lot of other decisions, but the only thing that he just decided to stand on is just to listen to the Word of God in every moment. If you have your Bible, go ahead and flip, well, maybe flip the page, to Matthew chapter 2. I've got to flip the page of my Bible. Right, Matthew starts chapter 2 with, with talking about some of the wise men and, and King Herod. We'll get there. Jump down to, to Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 for me. I'm going to start in verse 13. 13. And it says, After the wise men were gone, 
An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That night, Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary, his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt. Herod was furious when he realized that the wise men had outwitted him and sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years older, two years old and under, based on the wise men's report of the star's first appearance. Herod's brutal action fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. All right, God, when is enough enough? I think we've asked that question before. God, I had faith to this, this thing that just makes no sense. You're putting me in the face of public scrutiny. I've got to make myself a fool to obey your word. And you're just going to keep coming back and calling me to more and more obedience. You take Mary, there is this baby, well now you have to flee Egypt. Or escape to Egypt, sorry. It was, it was in there twice about this happened to fulfill the prophecy, such and such. Sometimes I just wonder what happens if these people wouldn't have listened. I'm sure that the Lord would have made it work, because he does. He doesn't need us. But we have such examples of what it really looks like to, to just listen. And not just listen in big moments. right? Because there is, there is that argument we could make as well, as well, if the Lord comes and says, like, this isn't, we, we have these things of Mary's going to be conceived through the Holy Spirit, that's not even naturally possible. I'll listen now. And then we get to this smaller moment. Jesus is born after the birth. Well, no, now to protect your family and to continue listening to the Lord, there's another angel. Well, I already had faith that one time. I don't want to do that again. God, don't take me to that limits and those depths of, of faith like that time. But Joseph listens to the Lord, he gets up, and he goes. Right, and it's a prophecy that is fulfilled through it. If we're willing to listen, not just in the big moments, not just in the small moments, not just when we need something, if we're willing to listen in every moment that the Lord speaks, and we just get up and go, there will be kingdom work done. There will be parties in heaven, because I do believe that the Lord will use that to bring people to salvation. Like, that is the very point. It's to fulfill prophecy of the Messiah, which proves Jesus is the Messiah, and is the one that has brought salvation to all the people. But we have to be willing to stop and consider what the Lord is saying, and then do it. Which is what Joseph really, really embodies to us. Like, this is what I want you to take from Joseph. He made obedience to the Lord a habit. And the crazy things, like the, one of the first details we get about him was that he was a good man. He was a righteous man. He was a man that wanted to know God, that desired to keep the laws of the Lord, that desired to live a life faithful. That's not just a decision you make when you feel like it. Righteous men didn't just worship the Lord when it was convenient, when it felt good, when it was really easy. Having an angel come to you basically says you're the woman you are engaged to is going to have the Son of God and you're going to have nothing to do with it. That's not easy faith. But Joseph is willing to take 
a back seat to fall kind of into the backgrounds of this. And I think it's because we're always told that he's just in touch with the Lord. There's, <laughs> when you ask people to do things, you always get the, the super spiritual response. Let me pray about it. Right, there are some things and some decisions that need to be prayed about. But interestingly enough, we're told that Joseph considers this, and as he's considering what to do, the angel of the Lord comes. The second he wakes up, he makes the decision just to do what the Lord had told him to do. The angel of the Lord comes again and says, get up and go to Egypt. We're going to get a third time where the angel of the Lord says, get up and go back to Nazareth. And Joseph just gets up and goes. Like, where does that come from? And it has to come from a place where he is just constantly in touch with God. That we don't have to sit and question and pray about all of these major decisions because when the Lord just says, go, we listen in the moment. Obedience is a habit, and we just go. We make obedience a habit, right? We stay in touch with God through prayer through the Word, so that we can live in touch with what the Word is calling us to do and what He is calling us to do. Right? When Herod dies, there's an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. He says, get up. Right? Take the child and his mother back to the land of Israel because those who were trying to kill the child are dead. So Joseph got up and returned to the land of Israel with Jesus and his mother. Right, Joseph just he, he just gets up and, and goes like unhesitant faith. That when the Lord says you need to go, it's not, well, are you really calling me? Are you really sending me? The answer is just yes, you've chose me, I'm gone. Like here we go. And despite this, and when he learned that the new ruler of Judea was Herod's son, Archelaus, he was afraid to go. I don't think this is the first time Joseph has fear in what the Lord is calling him to do. But this constant moment of listening is then after being warned in a dream. I think we can assume it was an angel coming to speak to Joseph again. Right? He left for the region of Galilee. There was redirection in their path. The family went and lived in a town called Nazareth. Once again, this fulfilled what the prophets had said. He will be called a Nazarene. There's faith to go. There's faith in the redirection. But it's because Joseph listened. Obedience wasn't just something he turned on or off. He didn't half the time live a life that was faithful to God, and the other half he, just, he did what he wanted to do under his own expectations and plans. He was a man that was committed to obedience. Knowing God, loving God, and worshiping God was the very essence of what he lived to achieve. Which is why, in a story that 2,000 years later, he's still not even the main character and talked about. We talk about Mary and Jesus. 2,000 years later, Joseph still has a backseat. But it's because he's a man who listens and is obedient, even if he's got to take a step back. Even if he's not the main character. And I think it's because he was so in touch with the Lord... That even though it seemed impossible, he knew what it was going to look like to the outside world. He was going to be made a fool, but he was willing to be made a fool for the kingdom. Uh, James chapter 1. I think this just this, this, this embodies Joseph. Uh, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Why? Otherwise, you're only fooling yourselves. Right? If you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, and if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, God will bless you for doing it. Listen, we've all looked in the mirror, walked away, and go, I don't actually remember what I look like. Right? I think the bigger one is, you look at your outfit, you walk away, and... By the time I pull in here, I'm like, I don't actually remember what I put on this morning. 
Right? Sometimes our faith is just that same way. Like we look, we read, we read our scripture, say our little prayer, we walk out the door, and we've walked away from what that says. We don't remember what we read, we don't remember what we prayed, and then we sit there in the middle of our day and go, where's God? If we are willing to listen to the word and obey it, we remember who we are. And we remember who he is. Those are the two things that Joseph remembered the whole time. Joseph knew who he was at this point in light of what God's plan was. He knew who he was as a faithful man to the Lord. And he said, that's what I'm going to live out in every waking moment of my existence. To obey the word, to obey the Lord, and that is how we will receive the blessings that only come from God. Right, and it begs this question of how important is obedience to God? This is personal. Because I think we could sit there and go, well, yeah, it's all really important. It's something we should be doing. How important is it to you? The number one priority of Joseph's life was to obey the word of the Lord. His primary importance and desire in life was to know God. Do you live with that same urgency to know the Lord? Right? And do we listen to God in the moment? Like, when he's calling us in the moment. Right? What happens if Joseph stops and says, well, I need a month to pray about this? What if Joseph doesn't stop and listen to what the Lord is saying? Right? These are all very human responses that Joseph would have been affirmed for by everybody around him. But he had enough faith to listen in the moment. Right? We don't know when God's calling us, who God is calling us to. Right? Think of how many people you interact with on a day-to-day basis. And how many of them you really don't know. And you just never know who you might cross paths with. Or what the Lord might be calling you to moment by moment. Do we have the ears and the heart and the humility to listen? Pray with me this morning. God, I thank you for characters like Joseph. And God, this is a reminder for, for us as, as we just move through Christmas. We, we love talking about Mary. We love talking about Jesus. But God, thank you for the humility of Joseph. That we can step back and realize we may relate to Joseph more than sometimes we think we do. That in the same way you called Mary to be the mother of God, you called Joseph, to the same level of faith, the same level of obedience. And God, we get to sit and talk and study a man who said yes. God, we thank you for choosing us in the same way that you came and chose Joseph, and he said yes. God, give us the heart that every disciple should have, which is when you say up just to say yes, Lord. God, my prayer is your spirit convicts us, it molds us to be more like you, continue to make us more like your image. God, and in response, in our love for you and desire for you, we worship you and we keep your commandments. God, obedience is a habit. We listen. We have a listening heart that is willing and urgent and desires to hear from you to listen to your voice. And God, when you speak, may we have enough faith and courage to act. Because it is through this that with Joseph, prophecy was fulfilled. But God, if we're willing to do that, who knows who you will be leading us to. But God, you are the one that grows the seeds that are planted. And may we just be willing vessels to live it and allow you and your kingdom and your glory to be made known on this earth. 
It's in your name we pray. Amen.